Hey everybody, hope you're having a great day. I am so excited about what we're going to be doing uh, in our webinar today. And really I'm excited about what we're doing this webinar and our next webinar because today we're going to talk about how to turn intentions into reality. And Coach Mike, Pastor Mike has a 10 steps that when I read those, I thought, man, these are so, so good. And then the next webinar, we're going to actually talk to you about how we're getting ready for Easter at Faith Family Church. So you're going to have a chance to grade us a little bit and see how good we're doing at turning our intentions into reality here in our own church. And of course, we all do better when we help each other, right? So that's what this is really all about. Uh, you know, I'm so proud of the church uh, one year and 11 months into COVID. I mean, pastors, you have stepped up. I mean, we've dealt with masks, no masks, people on both sides. We've dealt with social distancing. We've dealt with uh, vaccine, no vaccine, and all this stuff is going on. And to the end, we would love to use it to scatter the church, right? But I just feel like God has his church ready, kind of like Gideon's army. You know, some people got a little bigger, some held steady, some might even be a little less. But who's in the army matters so much more. And so I'm really looking forward to talking about this today. Uh, Mike Conaway has been my dear friend, man, for almost two decades now, Mike, huh? Well, I think so. I think, uh, you know, I, when there's a little more gray hair. You, yeah. You've done well, not very much gray hair, and you still got all your hair. There's, so, some, there, there's so. some other things that happened to my body you could talk about. I'm trying to stay as yeah. slim and trim as you. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, yeah, but it's been, it's, I, I want to just say this too. It's been 20 amazing years. I mean, just the chance to not just fellowship with you, Jim, as, a, as another pastor, but learn from you, grow with you and impact people together. Isn't that what the journey with Christ is all about? I mean, that's ultimately what fulfillment is all about. It really is. And uh, man, it's such a joy to do it together, especially, when you know, people have your back, you know, yeah. when, uh, true friendships. Somebody said, Mul multiply your joys and they divide your sorrows. You know, they cut them in half. And uh, that's certainly the kind of friendship that we've built over the years. You know, I want to, before we get, get into your points, I'm going to welcome our new members in a second. But there's something else I want to do, because almost every time I introduce you to somebody, I do this. And uh, you probably think, OK, here it comes. Jim's going to do it again. But I like people to know your story. And I know of two churches you pastored, right? So you pastored mm -hmm. two churches. And the first one was in the hood, and it grew big. Talk about that church yeah. first. Well, I, I think that, you know, I, I'm not a kid who grew up in the hood. Uh, my parents were, I guess you'd call them upper middle class. My dad was an aerospace engineer. And my mom uh, was a chief designer of all Boeing plants. Uh, she's in heaven now, but I mean, she was, she was a bigger deal than my dad. And, um, and so I kind of grew up in an educated family, but God called me to a non-growing area to what, you know, most people call the hood. And it was straight up the hood. And, you know, I was thinking about today when we're talking about being intentional, um, you know, bringing a dream to pass. Sometimes if we're not careful, we think it's the environment that stops us or the environment that makes us. But really, I think it's that environment on the inside. And so yeah. it was really a great learning lesson. And I kept that church along with another church that you spoke at, Jim, uh, that was more in the suburbs for over 20 years till I passed them on until I started the third church, actually, which is Fearless House here in Dallas. Yeah, yeah. And while you were at that church, uh, I mean, you had a lot of businessmen come because they loved how you were empowering lives. You had a lot of people yeah. grow up. You were kind of like E.V. Hill, only you were white. You know what I mean? You went right in yeah, there yeah. And, and you started, you know, getting some stuff done. But, but then something happened where all of us in Texas are going to know who you're talking about. And probably most people across the country, everybody loves college football because this guy was a legend. So tell them how Pastor Mike became Coach Mike. Well, it was, it was pretty simple because, uh, uh, you know, there's no great strategy. Sometimes God's working on our behalf yeah. as we're working on his behalf, yeah. right? And, and uh, I actually led Fred Akers, who was a former coach of the Texas Longhorns, just passed away a year ago. And it, it became like a father to me. Um, I led his son to the Lord who lived in Seattle and ended up coming to my church. And then they flew me down to meet with uh, Fred because Fred had just lost his job at Texas um, you know, Longhorns. He was coaching. But, but how many years was he there? I mean, it was a. Oh man, he was. I think national champion a couple times. Yeah, yeah. So Mac, Mac in Brown the lost his job too. So to put it in context, yeah, yeah. he lost it <laughs> yeah. like Mac Brown lost it there. But afterwards, I mean, they went, "Did we do the right yeah. thing?" Right. Yeah. 
And the whole time he was doing that, he had already been developing a company with his son, Danny Akers, called Akers Performance Group, which was really serving and helping with leadership and strategy, mindset and brainstorming with Fortune 100 companies and, and, and smaller companies, but mainly larger uh, companies. And so I really led them both to the Lord. And they just kind of liked my face, probably because I led them to the Lord and liked how I talked and began to develop and train me. Uh, to do what they were doing. And back then there was no such thing as coaching. You know, now we have life coaching and people call me the original life coach. I guess it's online that way, but, but really I wasn't. It was just that we didn't know what else to call me. We couldn't call me a pastor if I was going into IXL or Bell or, you know, you know any of these companies, they couldn't say, hey, Pastor Mike. So they came up with Coach Mike because Coach Fred was Coach Fred. And I was like, hey, we'll just call him Coach. And, uh, and so that was it. It was just simply by chance. And then, of course, you know, I, I think I've coached over 150 CEOs. Well, I know I have, but way beyond that. Lost count at that. Personally coached them and worked with them. But the whole time, I never stopped pastoring. I've been pastoring now for 35 years and, uh, and you know, written a few books, mainly for Christian business leaders. Um, but really, I was in the hood. I was pastoring the hood. I don't think I've ever told you this, this Jim, that I actually was getting frustrated after about seven years the church was growing I started at 27, so I would have been, I guess it would have been about four years, not seven years, about four years in, I went to the Lord in prayer, and I was like, all my friends are pastoring in the suburbs, their churches are wealthier, you know, there's, <laughs> there's more going on, homes are being built, and I'm in the, the middle, the, I mean, the pinpoint middle of the largest Section 8 housing area in all of Washington State, literally in the middle, and um, and our church was doing okay, but, you know, I just wanted more, I was a young man, I had I had intentions. They weren't necessarily God's though, but they were intentions and, and, and positive ones in a sense. I just wanted to do more. And I asked the Lord, hey, uh, is there another way? I mean, could you take me somewhere else? And the Lord asked me for a 20 year commitment. I stayed there 20 years exactly. Wow. Um, and, and after I had answered that commitment and said, yes, Lord, of course you saved me from hell. You know, what else am I gonna do? Of course, yes, sir. You know, that's the <laughs> attitude. Uh, within six months, I had a couple churches call me up and ask me to speak. I led Danny Akers and Fred Akers to the Lord. And I went from, from like, you know, obscurity almost, which, you know, it's not that big of a deal, but I mean, obscurity in my own city, right? Not just nationwide to, to, I mean, just being everywhere all in six months. So I wasn't any better. It was just that God, I think, honored the commitment to, in a sense, be invisible for a lifetime, because that's what it felt like. And, um, but, you know, yeah. but of course, we're his, we're his right? And yeah. so, yeah. so it, it was really, I think, you know, the, the number one intentional decision will always be, yes, sir, yes, Lord, right? And so, but it opened up all those other doors really supernaturally. Yeah, well, I mean, we talk a lot about how small counties are obscure places, and we want to celebrate yeah pastors who are in small counties, but you know what? We need to celebrate pastors in the hood too. And ironically, yeah. you and I met at a meeting with lots of really successful pastors. And you started yeah. telling me about how you, you were in the hood. It just like fascinated me that you were doing that. And Yeah, and I don't think there, any of those pastors were in the hood. No, no, no. Kind of who's who of pastors. Right? If, if they were, yeah. they were driving through pretty quick, I think. But no, yeah, they, they might know, have Jim, outreaches, you know, but they, they weren't yeah, pastoring no themselves. Yeah, yeah in, that, in that position. So anyway, well, I really look forward to getting into today because you spent how long with the Acres Group? 20 plus years, yeah. Yeah, 20 I mean, plus years. So, pastored full time and traveled the world with them. Yeah, so if we think that coming to church on Sunday and having our ability to execute is put on display yeah. and there's nowhere to hide mistakes, imagine coaching college football, you know? So yeah, no uh, you, you were with a guy who's talking, and Fortune 100 companies certainly are pretty serious about turning intentions into reality and, and they're. They're into execution, not ideation alone. Ideation is the beginning of execution, but obviously you had to go in yeah. there and, and the whole process, which you're going to talk about today, something you spent 20 years talking about. So we're looking forward to that. Before we uh, get started with these 10 things, I want to welcome a number of uh, new uh, members to Significant Church Network. 
uh, Pastor Darren Anderson from Waypoint Community Church in Zeeland, Michigan. Pastor David Cordell from Life Beyond Limits in Davie, Florida. Pastor Steve Cowan from my church in Mustang, Oklahoma. Pastor Mark Crary from Somerville Community Church in Somerville, Ohio. Pastor Anthony Hudgens from Eagle Sanctuary in Gilbert, West Virginia. Pastor Josh Hunt from Salem Baptist in Las Cruces, New Mexico. Pastor Emmanuel Igbinoba from Grace House Church in Dayton, Ohio. Pastor Sharon Jolliffe from Amazing Grace Church in Wheeler, Michigan. Pastor Jesse Knight from Full Gospel Christian Fellowship in Durrell, Newfoundland. Pastor Bobby Lewis from River Point Church in Pelham, Alabama. Pastor Jeff Ling from Clear River Community Church in Manassas, Virginia. Uh, Pastor Haley White from Life Point Worship Center in Paradise, Texas. Pastor Clement Mbuyi from Tree of Life Church, a really strong church in Frederick, Maryland. Pastor David McGuire from Restored to Life Church in Corpus Christi, Texas. Pastor Dan Quagliata from Shalom Life in Pickney, Michigan. Pastor Charles Reed from Kingdom Life Church in Colleen, Texas. Pastor Joel Santos from Faith in Action Church in Homestead, Florida. Pastor Tanner Sheehan from Christ Church in LaGrand, Oregon. Pastor Doris Smith from Harvest Fellowship Church in Red Bay, Alabama. And then the last three are from Texas. Pastor Ray Ramon Vela from uh, Breathe Life Christian Church in Harlingen, Texas. Pastor Kevin Ward from Connect Community Church in Pasadena, Texas. And Pastor Stephanie White from Life Point Worship Center in Paradise, Texas. So we're so glad all you guys are, are a part of this. And again, our goal is to get pastors out of being in that place where they're isolated and they're they're separated and they're secluded into a place where they find like a society of friends, a band of brothers and sisters that help yeah. sharpen because, you know, we've all got iron in us. And when iron sharpens iron, God does great things. So, well, Pastor Mike, let's go ahead and talk about turning intentions into realities. Well, and I love the title. Um, I, I think you guys picked the title. I don't think I picked the title, but Jim, for 20 years, I don't think you know this, we taught a curriculum called Tools for Intentional Change. And, and so this is kind of up my alley a little bit. So I'll just throw a few ideas out. And, and Jim, your, you know, your ability, I mean, you've served at a couple different levels. Number one, pastoring a church. Number two, I guess you could say really truly pastoring all of us, pastoring a, a large organization. And, um, and then you've also raised all of your kids. I'm most proud of you because I know your kids because you and Tamara have kids who love Jesus. I've been very fortunate in that way as well. And so you can't do all those things without constantly reevaluating both in family, in business, and in our spiritual life. What do we need to change? And how do we go about changing? Because it's not as easy as most people think. In fact, resistance always happens when we want to personally change or we want to do some, see something change in our organization. So it's very typical for a lot of resistance internally and externally all at the same time. So, so I've got a few things. So just jump in there anytime you want, cut me off. And, and I'm sure you've got great stuff to say, just like, I think some of my notes will, will give us a foundation. So the first thing that I just wrote down is, is in our title, the key word is turn. Uh, it's turning our intentions into reality. And so, of course, you know, as believers, we use that language a lot because we're always asking people to turn from this place and move to this place out of darkness into light, out of the kingdom of darkness and into a kingdom of light. So that's the language of the church. And we should lead the way in, in being able to change and change effectively and bring positive change and take what God puts in our heart as a, as a God intention uh, and really make it happen. So, so we've got to get good at it as pastors. And I've noticed this, maybe some other pastors have noticed this, that, uh, and I want to just uh, brag on you, Pastor Jim, for a little bit. So, so the, the significant church, uh, as we went, started going through COVID, as an organization began to grow rapidly. And we saw that just now as you welcome new churches in. And we do this every single month. We're welcoming in a lot of new churches. A lot of other organizations, really good preachers, tremendous organizations have not experienced that. And I think the reason is, Jim, is, is your willingness, even at, you know, we're 
we're, we're not young anymore. I think, you know, we're about the same age around 60. And so we're at that age where most people settle in and pastors are needed now, even as we get older, whether we have sons that can take over and daughters that can take over, we're still running that race with them for a while. And our wisdom is important, but sometimes as we grow our churches and as we grow our ministries, change becomes harder. So let me just get right into it because we also need to turn. It starts with us. Um, here's the first idea. Number one, we must give great care to our intentions. That sounds kind of simple, but it's kind of like um, our physical bodies. If we want to stay healthy, we've got to care about our physical body. And sometimes we don't. <laughs> I'm guilty of that, right? We just kind of let things go. But I think anytime we start feeling this need for a change, in other words, we want kind of a different reality. We're in a reality and we think, ah, this reality isn't really what matching up with how God sees my reality to be. Like he wants something to change and change is gonna turn our reality into something different. And when that happens, it, it really is like taking care of a body. So much so that the, what we do as a living as pastors, our calling is a body. It's the body of Christ. And so the first thing I just want to, and I think I only need to say that unless, Jim, you want to jump in on that. Um, it's, it's really taking care. And in order to take care, you need two simple things. You need to evaluate where you're at, truly evaluate. Like, you know, if you're a little overweight, you got to be honest with yourself and not yeah. be offended, right? And you got to say, okay, now how do I get there? Which diet plan, which exercise plan am I going to, am I going to execute? It takes both those things. Yeah, and, and there's so many answers really out care. there. You know, we, we, with yeah. our, we have our staff chapel every Tuesday at 830. And what we're doing now is at their tables, all of our department leaders are sitting with their employees and their refining objectives. You know, we're coming out of COVID. Yeah. Hopefully we go from pandemic to endemic. So objectives are gonna shift a little bit, but we, we, we like to, to have a clear, complete plan because what happens is when you have too many priorities, they compete with each other, but we, you can get it really clear. And the only thing I, I wanna say about this is I've, I've always liked the phrase that how you do anything is how you're gonna do everything. So uh, I would good. just encourage people to take whatever area you want to take. Let's say it's diet. Well, I might miss one of these, but I remember a guy kind of put it this way one time. He said, if you'll just think fingers, feet, uh, fork, and I'm going to say fun. Okay. So my fingers, am I eating the right stuff? My feet, am I, am I exercising properly? Uh, my, my, my fork am I eating the right things? So my fingers, don't be smoking and doing stuff that's going to hurt your health. And then yeah. f fun, do I find it in Netflix or do I get a good night's sleep every night? Now, when you take one area and you get it better, it starts making you hungry to get to do it more and more areas. Yeah, so good. And we all know that because when we get on a roll in something like going to the gym, yeah. you know, it takes a little while, right? At first you're yeah. just sore, but then yeah. you get on a roll and your body starts almost demanding you go there. It's kind of like, hey, it's time to work out. I, I like this. And I think that's just really a simple thought that, that our intention, our dreams, our visions, whatever you want to call them, uh, as they're starting to move to bring something into reality, we, we have to remember, we have to take care of them. Like we would take care of anything. If it's going to last and accomplish, it's actually taking care of it. Here's the second idea. Uh, intention, this is something... I was with a, a large company in California one time, Worldwide Nursing, and I had the opportunity to, to completely be part of the retooling of their organization. They're the biggest uh, nursing. They, they, you know, they, they put nurses in positions all around the world, and they're the biggest in the world. And, and her husband was also a CEO, and she was also a CEO. Um, and so it was a really powerful couple. But I had to remind them, I sat down with the two of them because they, they, they were kind of struggling, you know, a lot of stress on the family. They had two kids. They're both CEOs of two aggressive companies that are moving forward. And I said, remember this, anytime you start bringing something to pass, anytime, uh, energy starts building up in you. And, and energy is good and bad, right? I mean, you can, you can get frustrated easier. You can get angry easier. Um, and so you really have to manage emotions, which are energy, right? Uh, emotions are so full of energy that a human being, I've done this before, I've come home from pastoring, loving people, and, and 
in an irresponsible way, I say that carefully, irresponsible, because there are some responsible ways to do this, got into an argument with my wife. And how would you do that? You're anointed. You just got done ministering and praying for people and preaching God's holy word. And you come home and get in an argument with your wife. The answer is, is to that is that anytime your intentions are happening, you're moving, energy is building up with you and you really have to manage it and, and, and be aware of it because you could lack it. You could be exhausted from it. You could have a certain amount of energy. And if it's gone, if you use it in a way that is irresponsible, it could hurt people because it is energy. And Jesus said that, didn't he? When a woman touched the hem of his garment, he responded by saying, hey, virtue or energy or power just went out of me. And the reason is, is he was so full of vision, so full of intention. But yet he took that and guarded that and made sure he realized that, especially us pastors, I, I had it. I had an older pastor one time say this to me. I thought it was amazing. He said, you know, when you have a guest speaker come in, um, don't let that speaker, that preacher, pastor, whatever that person is, don't let him out of your sight for four, three to four hours after he preaches. And I said, what? He goes, there's more sin committed directly after that time. He's in a different city. He's had the anointing on him, which makes him brighter and faster and right? And brings attraction to him. We have this treasure in an earthly vessel. So just take him out to eat, let him come down off that anointing because he could make mistakes or she could make mistakes. Why? Because energy is flowing through them. And I mean energy in a, in a godly way, you know, God's power, but it's true in all things. It's true in anything we're doing in business with our employees that we've got to always make sure we're managing our energy level as well. Yeah. So if we want to give the greatest care to our intentions, in other words, really, we understand Psalm 139 that God put a book in our heart per se. And we're living out the so chapters. Good. We're living out the chapters of those books. And, yeah. and don't, don't let the enemy steal the book that's on the inside of your heart. Then we let those intentions start building energy, which for me, yeah. like it's, it's, it's this town, it's small towns. Man, there's stuff around me all the time. The devil's faithful. He could always kind of get you down, but you just don't think about that. You just think about what you're excited about seeing here. You start building up your energy inside. Your third point is, is probably, my, probably the one I'm most curious about. So let's talk about it. Yeah, it, it, there is a tendency, I think, for people to forget that Judas, which is my third point, uh, I'll read it to you. Judas had good intentions. Uh, Judas was one of the 12. He would have laid hands on people and saw them healed. He was sent out two by two uh, with one of the other guys. We don't know which one. Um, he walked with Jesus for over three years. And, and so we, we know this, that Judas when he betrayed Jesus, ended up taking his own life within a short period of time. Even the, even the silver that was given to him, he threw to the ground. And the reason I believe is really simple. His intentions, his heart was that Jesus, he saw the power of Jesus. He saw his ability. He believed in him. Yet he wanted to take what Jesus wanted to accomplish and use it for something else. Probably maybe to stir up an army against the Romans. He, in a sense, he was, he, his, his intentions in his own mind were good, but they weren't intentions that were submitted to Christ. I think, I think that's the story of my life with, with pastoring in the hood. You know, I was a, a successful kind of young guy. I was an achiever as a young man. I played sports at a high level. And so, although I found myself pastoring in the hood, it didn't take too long where I felt like it wasn't the right thing for me. You know, I needed to do something different. And I've often thought if I wouldn't have said yes to the Lord when I went to him honestly and said, I want out of here. That's really what I was saying. I want out of here. I want a chance at something bigger. And the Lord spoke to me and said, no, this is where I have you. And I want a 20 year commitment from you. He didn't ask me for my whole life, but he did ask me for 20 years. At that moment, that decision to take my earthly intentions and submit them to his intentions and really let them be redefined. My intentions aren't necessarily, my ambitions weren't necessarily evil, but they could become that. 
So I'm asking the Holy Spirit, which is our really our divine advantage as believers, that we can check in our intentions with his and make sure they're in alignment with him. And here's the good news. He rewarded me though for that. So I didn't, I didn't ask for a reward. I was just being obedient. But there is a reward in submitting our intentions to his intentions. And the, the world doesn't have that opportunity unless they're believers, you know, in, the, in a corporate sense. Uh, but as believers and surely as pastors, uh, we have that. And, and I'll, I'll just say this one thing also. Uh, Judas would have done really well if he would have shared that idea with a couple of the other disciples because he may have gotten some counsel. Good. And, and some people might argue, no, he was just filled with the devil. Well, only at the end, because negative intentions, even when we think they're good, how many intentions that people thought were good, especially pastors, you know, people have been in your church. They had good intentions, but, but they, they didn't bring the reality. That, that is for. so good yeah. because yeah, like people that have an intention for righteousness, but they're not yeah. loving and they drive people away. That's or, right. Or the other way, people have a desire not to offend anybody, but they, they you know, don't, don't share the truth like they should. And so people, yeah. you know, Mike, when I read this, I thought about, we think Judas, we think betrayal. And then you just added, you think Judas, Judas you think death. And really disobedience is betrayal to our dreams and disobedience yeah. is the death of our dreams. Now we've got a ton of, of real mature pastors with us today. So a lot of them have, have overcome this hurdle, but they have a lot of staff who are young. And I think almost yeah. all of us failed at this before we succeeded, you know? And that is for me, when people are coming to you with their intentions, thinking you've got the ability to make their intentions happen. And sometimes you do, you know, sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is, uh, hey, I'm for you, but I can't put the energy of the church behind that because there's only so much money, time, effort here. And, and we're gathered here for purposes that are dear to everybody's hearts here. So I'll let people know you're doing it. And if people are attracted to it, then you can start a small group and we'll, we'll watch and see if people are called to it. But all that can be tough. But it, it's so important. The apostles knew exactly what they were supposed to do. And they knew it because of the Moses model. They were to pray. They were to minister the word. They were to model what it meant to live as a Christian. Paul said, let your life and teaching save people's lives. And then they were to appoint leaders and they were to take the hard cases. That basically that was, that was their job to do those five things. And so many times pastors that compromise that don't realize they're betraying the dream on the inside of their heart. And it's hard. I mean, I had a tough thing last night. One of those things that we as pastors, mm. it's hard on us. And when I woke up, the Holy Spirit was just so good. He said, you know, even when Jesus ministered, people receive zero fold, 30 fold, 60 fold. Not everybody in Fearless House is going to get the total value they could from you and Lisa as pastors. Yeah. Not, not everybody's going to get the total value they can from pastors out there. You just can't let it break your spirit, break your, 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 your strength, steal your joy, because then mm. your church, you quit doing the things that make your church as successful as it can be. And then your kids, instead of being attracted to the call of God, they have issues on the inside. Well, I, I think that's, um, actually amazing. It was, it was a better point than I made on my own, wow. on my own subject. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jim. I think I want to say this too, because this is maybe a shameless plug for a significant church and why I'm part of it. Um, oftentimes when people are getting around other pastors uh, and, and fellowships and organizations for pastors, we have this thought, and this is an okay thought, you know, I'm going to get around some people. They're going to help me become better and I'm going to advance, and, uh, and this is an opportunity that maybe can, you know, synergize with some other guys. All that's great. But, but oftentimes, it's, it's not the environment where you can open up, where you actually have good enough friends, where you can share it, things that you're thinking that they might, another guy like Jim might say to me, ah, Mike, you know, I don't know. Let me pray about that because that doesn't sound quite right. I've known you for a long time. That that is probably more important than the ability for Jim to open up a door for me or me open up a door for him. Doors opening, and I get it. I've been in ministry 35 years full time. I understand all of that, making connections and, and getting on the fast track. 
probably nobody's dealt with that more than Jim and I have in our lifetimes. I mean, we, we understand the fast track. But man, to have a brother who could just look you in the eye, or you can go to them. And I've done this. Jim, you know, I've, I've said, oh, man, I got to talk openly about what I'm going through. And I don't, I got to have some people I can trust. Uh, wow. When it comes to bringing t- intentions into reality, if you don't have trusted people around you with all that energy and all that emotion and all the stuff that builds up, uh, you're dead in the water before you know it. And it's true in business as well, too, um, but especially in ministry. Yeah, Max Licato said whenever he was uh, writing his books and they, they kind of blew up, the publishers obviously wanted to get him in, in front of as many people as they could, you know. And so his wife just went to the elders of the church and just told mm. on him, you know. And he wasn't doing anything bad on purpose, but his life was getting out of balance. And the elders of the church sat him down. He said it just saved his life. And I, wow. I think we all need that. I think you said to me one time that, you know, because you traveled a lot. I mean, you traveled to a yeah. lot of churches. You helped a lot of churches. You have a gift for kind of inspiring business people in churches, which is a really great gift. But, uh, you know, there are other people who can speak at churches, but nobody else can be the dad at your kids' ball games. And you've got you to be real to that, right, when you're in that kind of stage of life. Yeah. yeah. Well, it got so bad for me at times, Jim, and I know you haven't done this, but I, I, I have done this in my past where I would, I would turn down possibly a church, maybe any church sometimes because businesses paid me so much more, but I would turn down a smaller church um, just because in my own mind, I, I owed it to speak. I owed, I owed it to the Lord to speak to as many people as I could. And really all I was doing is not paying attention and not, and not going where the Lord wanted me to do, just going to the best opportunity. And so intentions are tricky. That's why I said they can build up energy and you're good or bad. And, um, and you know, again, I can say that publicly because I know that the, the friends around me aren't looking at me and going, oh my gosh, how terrible is he? I always knew that about him. They're going, hey, man, brother, we're in this together. We know how it is to move forward and to change and grow um, and, and to be a better person as we're going down that journey. Yeah, that's so good, so good. Well, it seems like up until now, we've talked a lot about things internally, that yeah. intentions can kind of die stillborn if we're not careful. And, and when we give attention to them right, we build energy. So if we ever get drained, that's a good thing to think about. Yeah. You know, that, that without vision, people perish on the inside. Uh, Judas had good intentions. Intentions need wise ears. And then, man, this is a big one right here, especially the busier life gets. Number five? Yeah, number five is courage must be developed. Uh, this is a tough one. Um, and, and I mean, I went into companies and, and used this exact point. And you think a business, companies, uh, employees, courage? Every good organization actually develops, and there's a thousand different ways to do this. But I want to encourage churches as well and pastors as well to develop a, uh, with people that you're growing, and not only just spirituality, but along with that, the type of spirituality that's courageous. Um, just real quickly, I'll, we've got to move by this point pretty fast, but a couple of my young guys came to me. And when I mean young, they're not even that young. They're in their early 30s. Um, and they said, Pastor, we want to change the name of our church. It's a new church. You named it. Uh, but we think it's not a good name. They said it a little nicer than that, but we like, we have a name in mind. And it was like John Lee, my son, and another young leader I have, and they're all really sharp. They're actually sharper than me in these areas. And they said, we want to call it Fearless House. And I was like, I kind of like the name, but you know, let me pray about it. And I, and I prayed about it. Here's what the Lord said. They are trying to be courageous right now. Now, this is a year, exactly a year before COVID hits. We change the name. A couple of older people leave. Uh, that always <laughs> seems to happen. And, uh, and all of a sudden, we start growing. But we also have a name to live up to when COVID hits. Good. And it doesn't mean we're irresponsible uh, house. It just means we're fearless house. And I, I thought what happened was, is I had done this one thing well. I've done a lot of things not so well um, or poorly. But I was, I was developing in these young guys a spirit of courage and women, their wives as well, some of these young leaders, because 
if we're not careful, the church becomes the ultimate safe house and the ultimate place you go to escape from the world because you need a you need time out from real you know dangerous things that are out there in the world. But the church has got to get a little bit of a dangerous spirit on it as well. As well. And I'm, what I mean by that is being courageous. What if God calls your church to do something? Are the people there courageous enough to bring to pass an intention? Because God's intentions are not always, um, how could I say it? They're not always safe. Sometimes they are, and that's beautiful. But sometimes they're not, and that's true in business. And so when you're gearing up for changes, it's going to bring danger. And so you've got to prepare for taking an intention and bringing it into reality. Because anytime you do that, it's going to be a little bit of a dangerous path for a while. There's going to be some danger ahead. So we need to work on our teams constantly, not just in spirituality. And I mean that in the, in the kind of feminine sense, right, where we're very spiritual, but also in the very spiritual sense of what it is to be a Gideon, what it is to be courageous, what it is to be a David. And that side of Christianity is important to bringing intention into reality. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I read these next two points because courage is something that comes easier to me. And there yeah. are times that the next one I need to pay more attention to that doesn't matter how much passion and courage I do something with. I have to have a really good continuing ed block so that I'm always sharpening my skills. So I'm always listening to podcasts and listening to stuff now when I'm working out, when I'm doing things, because you know, skill, skill and sharpness just go hand in hand. But when I read these things, I thought about, I think his name is Diophanes. Is that the right name of that yep, Greek? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who, yep. who, when his father loved him, his father was a wealthy businessman, left him lots of money, and the people in his care took his money. And he had a dream to be an orator and a politician and a person of justice. But man, he would fill his mouth with pebbles. He would run up hills. He overcame mm. impediments. And if, if you feel like inside, man, I know I'm not hitting my potential. Reading books like that are so good because I think about what would have happened to that guy if he would have believed about himself what everybody else believed about him. He was a weak little kid who had a strong dad and he was never gonna do much with his life. And that story blessed me so much. I remember the first time I read it because the first case he ever argued was the case over the people who stole his money and he got mm -hmm. you know, a lot of his inheritance back. But you know, courage that causes you to go into your next point to start developing skill, it, it changes things every time. And the Bible's a thick book. And I like to say it's because I've got a thick head. And there's a, lot, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff I can learn. That, I mean, I, I've read my Bible through now, Mike, 40 times, you know? Yeah. So for a kid that thought the book of Job was about how to get a job the first time I read it, that's, that's you know, my life's been totally changed by the word of God. But talk to me about how you encourage companies to develop their continuing education programs and how, how to skill yeah. themselves. The, the difficult part with developing skills is it takes non-working time, right? That, that is always the difficult part, whether it's in our church, whether it's in an organization, investing in people's education and in new development of skills uh, takes time and it takes time away from producing sometimes. So it's, it's a real, you have to really have your end yeah, game. Yeah you know, clear. Uh, a couple of people I know that are phenomenal at this. Uh, Philip and Holly Wagner. I would imagine, you know, Philip yeah, and Holly Wagner yeah, from yeah. Oasis LA. You know, they're moving to Texas. I thought they already had. Uh, they hadn't done it yet. Yeah, they, ha they, they have moved. Their house isn't done. So they've, they've got a temporary house. They just popped into church uh, on Sunday. Oh, good. Uh, good. I didn't even know they were coming, right? So, so they were here. And I was thinking about Philip. Philip reminds me a lot of you, Jim. Great guy. Um, but he was really one of the best I've ever seen at, at helping his leaders get skills and, and even himself staying up on his own skills. And I think that there's two things that have to happen, which is difficult. Like I have a church that would fit into the smaller family category now because I started a church in Texas. I didn't have a team. I didn't have any outside money. Bought an old building, emptied my bank account. And here I am with a family-sized church. I'm used to a few more skills in the building, right, in the church. Um, but I do have some people very skilled. So part of our goal over the next 24 months, uh, because COVID kind of puts a lot of things on hold because you're kind of maintenancing for a while. 
so one of our real plans is, okay, we've got to identify some people that would allow us to invest in them, not just with spiritual skills, but with some other skills. And we have to find some skilled people that we may not even know are in our midst. Uh, because skills are sometimes, and, and I'll just say this real, real quickly, in the church world, especially our world, and I would include myself in on this, we oftentimes pray for revival, which is beautiful, and we oftentimes uh, talk about the gifts of God so that we don't claim the gift ourselves. So in a, in a very positive, humble way, revival lets us know it's God doing it, and the call of God in our life versus our skills lets us know God is doing it in us. I think we always need to keep that. But we got to be careful not, not to forget that David was skilled with his slingshot. And it wasn't just a child, this slingshot. We know, we actually know that it was the most contemporary weapon of his day. And it was something that somebody like him could actually deliver the blow of a 45 caliber gun. And he could deliver it accurately. So when he says he killed a lion, it's like with a slingshot? Yeah, because this isn't a slingshot. This was a contemporary weapon of war where guys could actually hurl it over 100 yards accurately. And, and so there's this mixture, isn't there, in David? He, he had a skill, yet he was courageous, yet he was called by God. All of these things are things as believers and as leaders we need to remember to pay attention to. Yeah, I heard that John Maxwell has every employee of his on a continuing ed plan. And I think that's really good for us to do. And I'll tell you, when we started them at Faith Family Church, some people would just go to like devotional plans. And, and, and that might be okay for certain people that are working on being a son or a daughter of God. You know, they're not working so much on being a, a skilled servant. They're, they're maybe learning yeah. learn to live in God's love more as opposed to serving in what they're doing. So I'm not saying that's never the right thing. But when you talk about David, I, I think about like if I was a sniper, it would have really been like if I was That's a sniper exactly. and this skinny, ruddy, maybe redheaded guy <laughs> came up and he, and he outshot us all. And you're going, wow, what what got a guy that young to buy into skill like that? And uh, I know I was talking to somebody the other day and they were young and I said, well, we were actually talking about how we're going to teach our kids to live a spirit empowered life. We talked about where we're going to get our curriculums. When are we going to introduce it? Because, you know, kids, if you do that real early, they can get kind of, you know, just not strong. But so we start, we were in a staff meeting talking about how we're going to do it. And I started saying, you know, because the Bible talks about having your senses exercised and knowing, you know, the voice of God. And then I thought about Jesus was 12 years old in the temple confronting the, how, 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 how much did he have to say the skill of hearing God's going to be the critical thing in my life? Yeah, I think that's powerful. And I'll add one more thing to it. And I know we don't have much time. Um, but uh, as I've gotten older, uh, I realize that I'm in this, um, I'm in this uh, 100 meter relay race. And in a 100 meter relay race, 20% of the races ran together with the person in front of you. They actually start, they have a 10 meter start where they can start. Uh, so they have 30 meters to run as you're still running. But for 20 meters, there's a section where you're passing the baton and you have to do it really skillfully. They work so much on the baton pass because they're all great runners at that level. But for 20% 20, 20 of our ministries, we're going to be running with somebody, if we do it well, younger than us. Not, not, we're not just going to one day throw a baton at them. But here's why I say that, because I'm still working on new skills, like I'm working on understanding the value of certain cameras, because cameras change. I'm understanding the value of sound systems, and, and they have to explain it to me, and I have to have a good sense of some of those things. Business is a little different. Um, all of those things that we have to not just go, you know, here, I don't know nothing. You handle this for me, young person. Now we're running with them. We don't need to learn everything about what they're doing, but we also That's have good. a lot of skills that we need to develop that we might think we're past. So both sides are developing skills together. Like right now with Jim and I, of course, we have sons literally the same age. Um, and so they're actually developing skills going into ministry and doing very well. So we have some wisdom and some skills they don't have 
but they're also developing skills we're not. They're, they're different skills. Yeah. So I have to learn some of those too along the way. Uh, and so do, and this is, I only say this because we'd say this to employers, especially owners of companies, because pretty soon they just kind of get, well, I pay somebody to do that. Ah, you still have to develop yeah, skills. Yeah. You could say this in reverse a little bit, as other people are developing skills this way. You have to learn what skills they need and how to get their skills and, their, and, and, and actually help them along with their skills. So you can't be completely ignorant. So we never stop learning is a simple way of saying it. Yeah, that is so good. That is so good because the guy that would say that would really just kill his whole organization. I'm paying you. Well, not for long, usually, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, well, so, so now, you know, we, we're in touch with what's going on in our heart. We're living energized. Uh, we're not betraying the intentions of our heart, which all those things are hard to do, really. And then we're, we're bouncing our ideas off wise ears and we're living with courage and our skill is growing. And then we realize that it takes a team to reach any worthy dream. So that's kind of yeah. where we, we go into this last part, right? Yeah, absolutely. And leadership, I learned this from Fred Akers, which is um, pretty amazing. I, I, you know, I asked him one time, you know, um, uh, about football and how much it's changed. Cause I'm a soccer player. I'm not a football player, but uh, you know, I've been around sports my whole life. So, and been around great coaches my whole life. And, um, and he was saying how much the sport evolved during his time, how much he had to learn in terms of as a coach. Right. And, and so leadership skills, you know, I think this sounds obvious when I say it, but it's not so obvious. Sometimes we're in the middle of, of, challenging times or growth times both are you know both negative times and super growth times are dangerous times and um uh fred said i was committed so much to the idea of being a better leader myself because times change and it actually de demands a little bit different type of leadership as times change uh you, you can't lead the same way you, you led maybe 40 years ago or like i was I, I heard myself say this uh, to my wife one time, just not too long ago, probably a year ago. And uh, she was giving me some good counsel. And I said something I've forever told people not to say, <laughs> but I said it because I was just out of my mind, I guess, for a moment. And I said, hey, remember, I'm the pastor. Any pastor who has to remind people that he's the pastor <laughs> has stopped developing his or her own leadership skills, right? Because when you're in process and you see yourself as always in process of growing in leadership, you don't try to defend your leadership because you know you have to grow through almost everything with everyone else and continue to grow and set the example of growing in leadership. And Jim, you'd probably be better at it, especially amongst church leaders, because you are a phenomenal leader, not just in your church, but with people like me. I look to you for leadership. Um, so let me turn it on you for a second. What are some of the things you've done? Because I've known you 20 years, so that means you've evolved a lot. It doesn't mean you've, you've changed your beliefs in the word, but you as a leader have evolved a lot and met the challenges of times changing um, yeah. in well, leadership. Well, well, first, let me say, I mean, you were, on the, you were with guys and you were headed to be on the national youth uh, soccer right. team. I was, you know, my last level was making a Division I baseball team, you know, and so I coached a bunch of 13 year olds, my sons, and, and we, we made the AAU national tournament. And I knew people were smarter than I was. And I had a pretty good heritage. Yeah. I mean, my uncle played professionally. He was a director of scouting for the Pirates. Uh, I, was, I grew up with these kind of guys, but I'm looking. And when you talked about Fred Akers and the game changing, I, I, I came home and I said to Tamara, I said, I didn't, think, I didn't think it passed me by that far. You know, so things wow. do pass you by. And I know for me that uh, when I got to, you know, when I was, when I was, came here in 1989, I could see things the church needed to be, and you feel like you implemented those right away and things went well. But around 2000, I realized that I'd been in my bubble for too long. And so there have been lots of times mm -hmm. that I realized, hey, the church, the music, it's got to change. Or then when millennials started coming to work and started becoming key leaders, we did a small group with them. And thank God for people like Covey who do all this research and yeah. they can put you in a room and you can talk. But I don't know if I'm, if I'm an example or not. I, I know that 
you know, like you, I want to work my tail off because I know that the reason churches fail is because everything around you is changing. And I don't want to be great at pastoring in a, a 1968 church somewhere because it's, it's not yeah. going to it's not going to bring the changed lives that, that we want to bring. So uh, for sure. Uh, and you, Coach Mike, you told me this and this really helped me. We were in our 50s at the time. And you told me that the average age of the CEOs of most uh, successful companies is early 60s. Yeah, correct. It, it doesn't mean they think they know what they're doing, though. But what does the president of Nike do? Tell them what you told me that night. Yeah, I, I think um, if I remember, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, wh one of the things that um, uh, I think is important to understand about leadership in general is that you can be a great leader when you're young. You can be a great leader when you get a little bit older and you can be a great leader in between. But you can't be a great leader if you don't know where you're at. And, and, and to self-examine a lot. Um, it's just impossible. I'm not sure what, you, you might have to give well, me a little more insight on what I told you. Well, what you were telling me is just how obviously they weren't the ones out on the, you know, I'm not going to go out in the playground and play basketball like uh, I did at 20-something. Absolutely. So when I absolutely. was 20-something, I know what everybody wants. I know what they're thinking. But the way yeah. that these guys actually train their young leaders and even their future successors is by listening to them. And, I, you know, I, I think John Newell no said it this way, that we got to yeah. pour our wine into their wine skin if we're going to succeed. And if you think of it that way, yeah. it really helps. Well, at our last conference just a few weeks back, um, I had a, a, a moment and I shared this simple thought. And I think it's a good thought for all of us. When I listen to guys in their 30s, especially guys in their late 20s to early 30s, maybe mid to late thirties, even that means they're just beginning to kind of reach that combination of strength and wisdom. It starts kind of sinking together at that age group. Um, and then by the time you're my age, I'm 60, you have a lot more wisdom than you do strength, but they're in a very cool time in their life where strength and wisdom are starting to kind of equalize in their life. And because of that, I always believe God is speaking to that generation whatever, you know, the next generation, you could say it that way. And their, their ear is on the railroad tracks of the Holy Spirit, hearing the sound of God. So I don't always feel at 60, like I need to hear everything and know everything. I'm actually want to listen to guys that age and grow with them because I can add wisdom to them, which is usually needed. And if I can kind of create, and this is a little off topic, if I can kind of create a synergy with some people younger than me, where I actually really respect them of having a strength I don't have or knowledge I don't have, but also I have something that they can only get with time, uh, which is more wisdom. I can save them from major failure. And this happens both in business and in ministry, major failure. And they can save me from becoming obscure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that is such a great, I mean, isn't that what's so cool about having kids? They carry your name. So one day we'll all be gone, but they kind of make us still alive in a way, right? I love what it says about Abel, the fourth man recorded in the Bible. It says, though he's dead, yet does he still speak? Because he had something to say. And uh, my mom still, still speaks to me, mentors from my past. Fred Akers is still speaking to me. Um, and I, I think that's a powerful thing that can happen within organizations. It's sad because the church oftentimes fails more in that than the world does. Um, and, and I think it's something that we have to, you know, work on. I'll just say that I have to work on. Yeah. I'll, I'll say it in a, in a more humble way. Yeah, well, we're going to enjoy working on it for Easter. We're going to have our marketing director. We're going to have yeah. our service directors up here. And we're going to talk about what we're heading into next time we come together. We got about five minutes. And Coach Mike, I'm going to mm. read these 10 things to give them to everybody. And I'm going to let you know we have other resources on the website yeah. that can help you. But, you know, when you were talking, my mind went back to 1981. And my brother was coaching at Tulane University. And I would go work as a deputy sheriff in the summertime and play in a sheriff softball team. And that gave us a chance to hang out. And the quarterbacks at Tulane were being mentored by a legend that played for the New Orleans Saints. Do you know what his name was? Archie no. Manning. Oh, my gosh. So Archie Manning would come into my brother's weight room, and he had three kids that would follow him into the weight room. 
You know what their names were? Cooper Manning. Uh, yeah, obviously, right, yeah. Peyton Manning and Eli Manning. Why didn't I get their autograph? What's wrong with me? Who, right, who would huh? have ever dreamed that these little guys were going to grow up, but they had, they had Archie Manning blood in them, and, and they, were, they were trained, and he, he evidently right. did a lot right. But, you know, when you were talking about that, uh, Mike, I'm going to do this quick so you can, you can finish up. But when you were talking about it, I thought about that African proverb that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, mm. go with the group. And so many so guys, to me, that's the strength of significant churches. We're going as a group and we're seeing God without do things. A doubt. Yeah. With, without a doubt. None so. of us are the smartest guy in the room. We all know something. We don't know everything. But a lot of guys will listen to things on their own and they'll, they'll have a lot of good concepts, but they never become part of a tribe. And it really keeps them yeah. from... You know, you need more than knowledge. Sometimes you need strength. Sometimes you need a friend that will listen. And uh, to live a really good holistic life, you need to have a lot of good people around you. So, so I enjoy that. But let, I'm going to go through these 10, and I'm going to let you finish it here. We have to give the greatest care to our intentions. They build energy in us. Slay the Judas inside of us. Don't let him yeah. win. Uh, intentions need wise ears and friends. you got to be courageous. Give yourself to skill development. You're going to have to develop leaders, build teams, and plans have to be developed. And that's where I want to say that we, we have a, a webinar on that that was one of our really watched webinars. That if you go, you can find a webinar that helps you do all those things. And then oversight must be developed. I can tell you, I, I hope you talk about this one because I can tell you that in the level of what I run now, uh, ca catching it can be harder than fixing it sometimes. Hmm. Wow. Uh, oversight gets tougher as you get older because there's very, there's very few people older than you to, to give you oversight. So you have to start looking to your peers uh, for oversight. So it, this is very difficult because when you're a little bit younger in ministry, especially let's just talk ministry. It's true in business, uh, but in, in ministry, uh, it's, it is a little bit easier to humble yourself. You know, there's maybe an older mentor in your life, maybe were that in your life, and you can kind of come to us, man, I'm dealing with this, or I'm going through this. And you kind of know that we've probably been through it and we're probably not going to judge you. And there's not, we're also not trying to match up and compete with each other. But as you get older, like uh, Jim and I, most of our mentors are gone. But you still need people in your life keeping eyes, not on you like judgmentally, but where you can come to each other. And I'll just say this because you talked about tribes and I'll, I'll close with this. Um, and again, I don't want to make this sound sales pitchy with the significant church because we don't get anything out of somebody joining. We just get to give more. Yeah, that's that's yeah, the mentality. Nobody makes that we any have. money. It just all goes that, into right. investing in pastors. Yeah. Yeah, so. I took a couple friends to our last conference and they were surprised it was free and they didn't have to pay for the food. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so the, the reality of it is, though, is that you can get in a tribe that just cannibalizes you and eats you. And, and so you really, especially, now, we've got about half and half now. Like at our last conference, you get about half of them are under 40, about half of them are over 40. So that's a good blend. But, but again, the, the older guys, for lack of better terms, because we're young older guys. I'll say it <laughs> loud and proud. We're young older guys. But, but boy, I tell you, I, could, I can call any of them yeah. and not feel. And, and with many of them now, because of my unique situation, starting a new church in my 50s like a crazy man, um, uh, I, 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 I don't have a problem with being smaller and I don't have a problem with being weaker and I don't have a problem with not being as important as them. And here's what's more important. They don't see me as smaller yeah. or unimportant yeah. or less valuable. That's, that's, that is something that I think if there's anything COVID has done, because God uses all things, even things he didn't create, he still uses those things. Uh, he is putting a demand on the body of Christ. And I just, I, I honor you, Jim. I think you met that demand. I don't know if you saw it coming, uh, but, but there's a reason, I think, why Significant Church has become significant in this time because it was difficult to get, well, I don't want to sound competitive. I'll just leave it at that, that, you, that this organization somehow, and it's probably something in your spirit, felt something was coming, whether it was this or not and responded to it and it was healthy it could handle it it could bear the weight of it and come out on the other side with intentional tools of change that brought us 
into some really good realities where we are right now. Yeah, well, I want to thank our local connectors because, you know, there are a lot of people that can give good content, and we have a lot of people, honestly, some of the messages in our conference, guys that were young, just blew me away. Oh, yeah. But the, the ability to have 10 guys in a room who really care about each other and who walk through life together, local connectors yeah. mean everything, and we're so grateful for those of you who are local connectors. Well, uh, Coach Mike, I got to tell you, it, it was great. I tell guys, just treat this like your lunch hour. You know, we're going to have guys that you love having lunch with. And, man, today was awesome. So I appreciate that for you. I, I appreciate that from you. Would you go ahead and just give us a quick 30-second prayer on the way out? That would be my honor. Father, I lift up every person that's on with us right now and, of course, those that will jump on later and watch it. And we just humbly, Jim and I, submit these ideas. There's, there's some of you out there, you're smarter than we are, and we need you but together we can. So Lord, in this hour that we live in, this time we live in, let us meet the challenge of it, not as individuals, but as a team, as a group of pastors binding our hearts together. Give us that courage to trust each other so that we can move into the future and take what's in our heart that we know is of you and have the courage, the skills, and all the things we talked about to bring to pass your will in this earth in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Well, man, it was great being together. And uh, guys, hope you had just knock it out of the park this weekend. Hey, we're closer to COVID being over than the day we started. That's awesome, isn't it? But God's working for good in all things. And thank you for keeping your faith strong and your team strong.